So I think it was Daniel who mentioned at the very beginning that uh, McMahonian theories, these individualist reductivist theories of just war might lead us to a version of pacifism. And uh, I'm going to argue that if we take McMahonian theories as they are, then this might very well be true. And I'm going to suggest a emendation, a modification to McMahonian, these individualist reductivist theories an emendation that would prevent it from falling into pacifism, but would still result in a theory of just war, according to which the wars that are just are less numerous than McMahon thinks, but more numerous than pacifists think. Uh, specifically, uh, I'm going to, following, following Seth Lazar, I'm going to argue that McMahon's theory entails a version of what I call proportionality-based contingent pacifism. Uh, now, of course, we might just bite the bullet here and say, yes, we should adopt proportionality-based contingent pacifism. But I'm going to say that, uh, I'm going to argue that this is too quick, that uh, contingent pacifism is a consequence of McMahon's individualist account of liability, uh, an account which I think is mistaken. If we replace this with a complicitous account of liability, then we'll end up with what I think is a much more plausible and realistic account of morality of war in its own right, uh, but one which still allows him to deny the moral equivalence of combatants. Uh, and, and a consequence will be that we, we will avoid uh, what I call proportionality-based contingent pacifism. But I'm going to start off by uh, explaining what I mean by proportionality-based contingent pacifism and distinguishing it from various other versions of contingent pacifism. So we've already used a bunch of different terms to demarcate and distinguish various versions of pacifism. I'm going to introduce my own set of terms now. I know it's a little bit confusing, but uh, so there it is. As long as we're up to 22, why not 22? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so I'm going to reserve the term pacifism, or absolute pacifism, and this is all war-based pacifism, relegated to the realm of warfare rather than one-on-one -on -one self-defense. So I'll reserve the term pacifism for the view that waging war is always morally wrong, regardless of how few people are killed or maimed. And I'll use the term conditional pacifism to refer to the view that a war remains a, that a just war remains a conceptual possibility, provided that no innocents are killed in war. It's still conceptually possible, just not very likely. And uh, contingent pacifists, on the other hand, acknowledge that though innocent non-combatants have a right not to be killed by others, the right is not absolute. Uh, for instance, this right can be trumped by considerations of proportionality. Nonetheless, contingent pacifists believe that for any given war with just aims, it's exceedingly unlikely that it's morally permissible to wage that war. Uh, this isn't to say that the possibility of a morally permissible war is merely conceptual, according to contingent pacifists. Rather, they say that there have been and in all likelihood will be morally permissible wars. As a result, it might seem that contingent pacifism is not a version of pacifism at all. But as I'm using the term, contingent pacifism still counts as a version of pacifism insofar as it treats war at the level of national and international policy as an, as an activity that cannot be illicitly undertaken. So on this picture, we ought to treat the prospect of waging a war in roughly the same way that we treat the prospect of committing an act of terrorism. As, as morally reprehensible as, te as terrorism is, there might be on very rare occasions circumstances in which it's permissible or even obligatory to engage in acts of terrorism. But this doesn't mean that we should have a department of terrorism or a government-funded and trained terrorist standing by to commit acts of terrorism on those occasions in which it's morally permissible. And similar with the uh, Department of Defense or Department of War and, and, and soldiers in general. Uh, now, this, this, so I've just characterized con uh, uh, contingent pacifism, and this can be distinguished with what I call epistemic-based uh, contingent pacifism. Uh, sorry, so we have, a portion, we have contingent pacifism up here, and I want to distinguish between two versions of contingent pacifism. Uh, according to what I call epistemic-based contingent pacifism, it's exceedingly unlikely that it's permissible to wage any candidate war, not because it's ex exceedingly unlikely that the war will satisfy all the conditions of a just war, but rather because we can't reliably determine which wars are just and which wars are unjust. <laughs> More specifically, we too often make false positive judgments. 
regarding whether a war is just. And the prevalence of these false positives casts significant doubt on the general reliability of a claim that a given war is just. So because going to war when it's impermissible uh, tends to be a very, very wrong thing to do, we ought to err on the side of caution by refraining from waging war altogether. So that's epistemic-based uh, contingent pacifism. Now I contrast this with, con with uh, proportionality-based contingent pacifism, which is the type of pacifism that I'm going to be concerned with here. According to proportionality-based contingent pacifism, any war with a just cause is exceedingly unlikely to be just because it's exceedingly unlikely, sorry, because it's exceedingly likely that it will violate the ad bellum constraint of proportionality. That is, virtually all wars will violate the constraint of proportionality. That's just to say that the harms the war imposes on the innocent are too great relative to the relevant evils averted by achieving the war's just aims. And there are various ways we might try to ground uh, proportionality-based contingent pacifism. It, it might turn out, for example, that as an empirical matter, wars, uh, including just ones, or ones that we've thought are just, result in far greater harms than we had thought, and future wars are likely to be no different. So this might be a way to ground proportionality-based contingent pacifism. But there are other possible grounds. We might conclude that intention is irrelevant to the permissibility of imposing harm, and we might decide that we ought to take intentionally imposed harms as the moral baseline. Uh, so it's not that intentionally imposed harms are as bad as collaterally imposed harms, but rather that collaterally imposed harms are as bad as intentionally imposed harms. On this view, collaterally killing civilians is tantamount to terrorism. This leaves room for the possibility of a just war, but it's a very small possibility. We are left with a, a proportionality-based contingent pacifism. But th these are just examples of how we might ground proportionality-based contingent pacifism. Now I'm going to argue similarly that McMahon's individualist account of liability uh, ends up grounding proportionality-based contingent pacifism, although this isn't the consequence that he wants. So, uh, McMahon, in a now quite familiar argument, argues against the moral equivalence of combatants by arguing that, for the most part, unjust combatants are not morally permitted to kill just combatants. Uh, just combatants, however, for the most part, are permitted to kill unjust combatants. And on his individualized liability-based account, an, ag an agent is liable to be attacked just in case that agent is responsible, even if only minimally, for significantly contributing to an unjust threat severe enough to justify the degree of preventive harm imposed on the agent as a necessary means of reducing or eliminating that unjust threat. So unjust combatants, as minimally responsible agents, have made themselves morally liable to be attacked by contributing to the unjust harms in virtue of which the cause for which they are fighting is unjust. But just combatants, that is, for the most part, combatants on the just side, but that's to use this distinction more roughly than he does, but just combatants do not make themselves liable to be attacked by targeting unjust combatants because engaging in necessary and proportionate defense against an unjustified threat does not make one morally liable to be attacked by that threat. So the moral equivalence of combatants on the McMahonian view was mistaken as a moral doctrine. The moral principles governing combat must distinguish between just combatants and unjust combatants. But this sort of account faces a problem of the sort which uh, Seth Lazar noted a couple of years ago, which he calls the responsibility dilemma. Uh, he points out that many unjust combatants are ineffective. Uh, this is true, he says, of a large portion of combatants. They're ineffective in that they fail to contribute significantly to the war in which they are participating. Indeed, they contribute no more than civilians do. Now since, according to this sort of McMahonian view, it's a combatant's contributions which make her liable to be attacked, if it's true that many combatants fail to contribute significantly, then these combatants can't, aren't liable to be attacked. The discrimination required to attack solely those combatants who are effective, who contribute substantially, would pro pragmatically preclude waging a war with a just cause. We are then left with a version of proportionality-based contingent pacifism. So wars as they are actually fought are unjust because they kill too many innocents, namely those combatants who are not morally liable to be attacked as a result of being ineffective. So the innocents that we end up killing too many of 
which count heavily on the costs called proportionality calculation, aren't just the civilians, but the ineffective combatants who are not morally liable to be attacked. Now, there's some empirical issues here. What evidence uh, do we have to believe that a substantial portion of combatants fail to contribute significantly to the war of which they are a part? So, uh, based on post-combat interviews of soldiers, uh, Brigadier General S.L.A. Marshall concluded that only 15 to 25 percent of Allied riflemen in World War II who were in a position to fire their weapon at an exposed enemy uh, did so. And Marshall's methodology has been criticized since then, uh, but his general findings have been defended by Lieutenant, L Lieutenant Colonel David Grossman, uh, in his book On Killing, uh, and, and this book has been really influential in the United States. Uh, it's, um, it's on the Marine Corps' uh, Commandant's Required Reading List and is required reading for the FBI Academy, the DEA Academy, West Point, the United States Armed Forces, and in numerous peace study programs too. It's kind of interesting because you have this war that's required for peace studies programs and for these military institutions. What's the title again? It's On Killing by Dave Grossman. And specifically, Grossman notes that Marshall's, Marshall's claims about the ineffectiveness of combatants have been confirmed by numerous other studies. And here I'm going to quote Grossman. He says, in Marshall's case, every available parallel scholarly study validates his basic findings. Ardent de Pique's surveys of French officers in the 1860s and his observations on ancient battles, Keegan's and Holmes's numerous accounts of ineffectual firing throughout history, Richard Holmes' assessment of Argentine firing rates in the Falklands War, Patty Griffith's data on the extraordinarily low killing rates among Napoleonic and American Civil War regiments, the British Army's laser reenactments of historical battles, the FBI studies of non-firing rates among law enforcement officers in the 50s and 60s, and so on. So we have to take seriously the possibility that many combatants do not pose threats even when they're supposed to do so. Supposed to, you know, they have a professional duty to do so. And as a result, they don't contribute substantially to the war's aims. Now I'll call those combatants who do not contribute substantially to the war's aims, as I've been doing, ineffective combatants. And you should, I should note that whether a combatant is ineffective comes apart from whether uh, that combatant is competent. You can have competent combatants who are ineffective merely incidentally, and you can have incompetent combatants who get lucky and are, end, up, end up being effective. So can ineffective combatants be permissibly targeted? It seems that on the command's account, ineffective combatants are not liable to be taxed since they, by definition, neither pose nor significantly promote any threat. They have done nothing to lose their right not to be attacked. On McMahon's view, intentionally killing those who are not liable to be killed is permissible only if doing so is necessary to avert a substantially greater evil. Otherwise, the killing violates the constraint of proportionality. This is because, on McMahon's account, uh, killing non-liable persons intentionally is a much greater wrong than killing them merely foreseeably. So if ineffective combatants are not liable to be killed, and if both ineffective and effective combatants are intentionally targeted in war, then the scope of wars that can be morally fought is severely limited, since the vast majority of wars will violate the proportionality constraint as a result of targeting all these ineffective combatants. Now, the account I will outline of complicitous liability in war is, I believe, an improvement on McMahon's account in the following way. On his account, an individual's liability in an unjust war is determined largely by contributions she makes to that war. The trouble with such an account, in my view, is that we can't expect this highly contingent basis of liability to warrant categorizing liable and non-liable targets in such a way that unjust combatants systematically fall on one side and civilians systematically fall on the other side. Uh, we want to make this distinction in war, and the basis that McMahon provides for making this distinction is inadequate for drawing the line between combatants and civilians. So the account I'll develop does a better job, I think, of grounding liability in a way that tracks the combatant-non-combatant -combatant distinction. But I should note, it's not going to track it perfectly. Some non-combatants are going to count as liable, some combatants are going to count as non-liable. The, the line isn't going to be perfect, but it's going to be a lot closer to what I take to be common sense intuitions in current practice than what I think McMahon's view uh, is. So. Uh, so uh, well, 
I think the issue of whether an individualized liability-based account can cope with the prevalence of ineffective combatants is merely revealing of what is fundamentally mistaken about such an account. I mean, we can criticize McMahon by saying, look, he, he hasn't taken into account these ineffective combatants. But the presence of ineffective combatants is a largely contingent feature of, of, of military conflicts nowadays. And I don't think that the failure to take into account ineffective combatants is what's deeply, uh, what's fundamentally most problematic about his account. Rather, it's just revealing of what I think is mistaken about his account. Uh, what's mistaken is that he thinks that the basis of liability is determined solely or largely by an individual's contribution. Uh, in my view, any attempt to cast the net of liability by adverting to the largely contingent contributions of individual combatants will only approximate, at best, a more fundamental basis of their liability, namely their complicitous participation in an unjust war. So I'll argue in favor of a liability-based account of just war in which unjust combatants are collectively liable. They're collectively liable for the threats posed by other combatants on their side. This account fundamentally differs from McMahon's in what grounds the liability of unjust combatants. On my account, uh, except for those whose participation, who participate under duress, and I'll say that, about that later on, uh, on my account, combatants can be morally liable to be killed in virtue of participating as a combatant in an unjust war, even if that participation doesn't translate into any substantial contribution. So I'm going to, to do this, I have to present a preliminary account of collective liability in which participating in certain sorts of cooperative projects makes each participant, regardless of how much he contributes, partially liable for what others foreseeably do in that project in furtherance of the group's goals. And this is going to be pretty hard. Developing an account of complicit liability from the ground up is a big challenge, but I'll be giving at least an, outcome, an outline of such an account. So by grounding the liability of unjust combatants not only in their individual contributions in an unjust war, but also in their complicitous participation in that war, this collectivized liability-based account avoids proportionality-based contingent passivism, unlike McMahon's individualized liability-based account. Though, as I mentioned earlier, it will still mean that fewer wars are unjust than McMahon thinks, in my view. Uh, so I'm going to start off with an example of, of, of complicitous participation. Uh, so in my view, certain ineffective participants in a cooperative project can be, com can be complicitously liable to be killed if doing so averts significantly wrongful threats posed by her effective co-members. So uh, I'll begin with an analogy. Suppose, um, suppose there's a bank robbery, a case that's used often. Uh, a criminal mastermind puts together a plan for robbing a bank. Uh, she hires five individuals, each of whom agrees to participate in the robbery. Uh, the recruits are made aware that part of the plan is to kill the witnesses in the bank. Uh, the mastermind doesn't physically participate in the robbery. Instead, she provides the plan, the layout of the bank, the equipment, and so on. Uh, one of the recruits, Jay, is stationed uh, on the second floor balcony above the bank as a lookout. Uh, her role is the least important. Uh, in fact, the mastermind would have commenced with the plan even without a lookout. And suppose that Jay isn't a very effective lookout. In fact, she falls asleep on the job. Fortunately, at least for the robbers, Jay's incompetence has no negative effect on the robbery, uh, though her participation doesn't causally contribute to the robbery or the murders uh, either. The plan succeeds and two witnesses are killed. Now, though Jay causally contributed nothing, she bears some liability for the murder of the witnesses and the theft of the money. The claim here isn't merely uh, that Jay is liable to retributive punishment, which after all isn't subject to a condition of effectiveness. Rather, Jay is liable to be killed, on my view, morally liable to be killed if it's necessary to avert the harms posed by the other effective participants. That is, Jay is liable to be opportunistically killed. It is, in my view, intuitively permissible to kill Jay if it's necessary to stop the murders, even though Jay doesn't causally contribute, nor does anything to prevent uh, others from stopping the murders. So suppose that several blocks from the bank, a, a firearm and ham radio enthusiast, I guess this is, this is America, learns the details of the impending robbery and murders when she accidentally overhears their conversation, their walkie-talkie conversations on her um, radio. 
Uh, she, hears that the she hears on the radio that the robbers are only moments away from entering the bank and that they plan on shooting as soon as they enter. She tries calling the bank but receives only an automated uh, response. Not enough time to call the police. She has her sniper. No clear shot to the robbers. The only clear shot she has is to the lookout who's fallen asleep on the balcony. By shooting the lookout, falls over the balcony. This is, this is her plan. It's, 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 it's predictable that it falls over the balcony onto, the, onto their escape car, the getaway car which will halt, abort the attempt. And she succeeds. And in doing so, saved the lives of the would-be witnesses in the bank. Now, I think what the enthusiast did was intuitively permissible, despite, again, that Jay neither causally contributed to nor prevented anyone from stopping the robbery and murders. And clearly, the permission to kill Jay can't be grounded in utilitarian reasoning. If Jay were an uninvolved bystander, killing her would be intuitively impermissible. Rather, it's because Jay is complicitously liable that she could be permissibly killed, if necessary, to stop the murders. So at this point, it should be pretty obvious that I take Jay's role in the robbery and killings to be analogous to the role of an, an ineffective combatant in an unjust war. Virtually all combatants, effective or not, who agree to participate in the military can be held complicitously liable for what their fellow combatants foreseeably do in furtherance of the military's aims. Uh, ineffective unjust combatants are complicitously liable to be attacked if necessary to prevent the harms imposed by uh, effective unjust combatants. And this is for the same reason that Jay is liable to be attacked if necessary to stop the other robbers from killing. Uh, so insofar as killing ineffective combatants is unavoidable if just combatants are to engage in defense against effective unjust combatants, doing so is permissible. And this is, again, because ineffective combatants are complicitously liable. Now, I pose this to Jeff McMahon, and he has argued, uh, oh wait, I'm not there yet. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. So he argues that an individualistic liability-based account might be able to accommodate Jay's liability to be opportunistically killed. Uh, his view might ground Jay's liability not in her complicitous, though ineffective, participation, but in her culpability. On this view, a culpable individual can be liable to be opportunistically killed even if she makes no causal contribution to the harm which is averted by killing her. So on this view, Jay can be permissibly killed uh, though non-culpable non and effective unjust combatants will not be complicitously liable. Now, I don't think that this response from culpability works. If his argument is correct, uh, we can opportunistically kill an individual who is culpably but unsuccessfully attempting to commit a murder if it's necessary to avert a completely unrelated murder on the other side of the world that is about to be committed by a completely unrelated individual. This seems strange to me, but I recognize that uh, it, it seems strange because it makes liability fungible. Uh, but I recognize that intuitions are not decisive on this point, so for this reason I'll outline an account, which I said I'll do, outline an account of complicit liability, which will provide grounds for thinking that ineffective participants in a cooperative project with unjust ends can be complicit liable. So I had this example of the bank robbery. I, I attempt to pump some intuitions. Maybe it works, maybe it doesn't. Well, now I'm going to pro provide some foundation for the, for the example. Uh, so on my proposed account, I'm liable for the wrongs committed by other members of a cooperative project uh, one in which I intentionally participate, even if my participation fails to contribute causally to those wrongs. So we can call this the complicity principle. Uh, clarifying and defending it will take two steps. First, I'll explicate the concept of a cooperative project, and second, I'll provide preliminary reasons for thinking that participants in a cooperative project can bear complicitous liability for the acts foreseeably committed by the other participants. Uh, in doing this, I'll make the Complicity principle more precise by saying more about the conditions that determine the degree to which participants bear complicitous liability. Uh, and this account is inspired, though heavily modified, by the work done by Chris Coots on complicitous liability back in uh, 2000. So what's a cooperative project? There's, there's a lot of definitions and moving parts here, which is partly why I handed out the handout. Um, I, hope, I hope it's still track, track, trackable. Tractable, yeah. So uh, a cooperative project consists of individuals who share participatory intentions. And a participatory intention is an intention to act according to a role. The function of this role is to contribute to a cooperative act. So a participatory intention has an individual agent as its subject and has a role as its object. 
And this role, in turn, has a cooperative act as its object. So when individuals have participatory intentions with roles that have one and the same cooperative act as their objects, these individuals share participatory intentions. And a cooperative act is, in turn, an outcome consisting in or caused by the individual contributions of those who act according to shared participatory intentions. So acting, I mean, that, that's sort of the technical way. This is just, let's set out the architecture. But to put it in more intuitive sense, uh, acting on participatory intentions by acting according to your role is to do your part in a cooperative project, or at least intend to do your part. Whether participatory intentions are shared, that is whether we have roles promoting one and the same cooperative act, will depend on how the cooperative act is referenced in the object of our roles. So here's an example. How much, how much time do I have? Um, you can still go on. Okay. Yeah. So suppose a squad of soldiers is participating in the rescue of a wounded POW. So two soldiers in the squad are carrying the wounded POW while six others are laying down suppressive fire. Each of the two soldiers assisting in carrying the wounded POW shares participatory intentions in that they intend to do their part in furtherance of one of the same cooperative act, carrying the wounded POW. Under this description, their participatory intentions are not shared with the six other soldiers who are laying down suppressive fire. And those six other soldiers, in turn, share participatory intentions of their own. So the six laying down suppressive fire are participating in one cooperative project, and the two carrying the wounded soldier are participating in another cooperative project. But all eight soldiers in the squad share the broader participatory intention of doing their part in furtherance of rescuing the wounded POW. The narrower cooperative project of laying down suppressive fire and the narrower cooperative project of carrying the wounded POW are both nested within the broader cooperative project of, of rescuing the POW. And the entire squad itself is nested within the, within the even broader cooperative project consisting of a platoon in virtue of the more general participatory intentions that they all share. And as we move outwards concentrically, generalizing shared participatory intentions along the way, we can characterize each soldier in the squad as part of a cooperative project encompassing the nation's army and eventually the armed forces as a whole and perhaps even the na nation's citizenry itself, which is a possibility I'll consider shortly. So uh, to each soldier in the squad, we can attribute partial authorship of the cooperative act in which rescuing the POW consists. That is, each soldier is an inclusive author of this cooperative act. Each soldier in the squad is also an inclusive author of the cooperative acts which the rescue of the POW consists in. So the soldiers laying down suppressive fire are inclusive authors of the cooperative act consisting in physically carrying the POW to safety. And the soldiers physically carrying the POW to safety are inclusive authors of the cooperative act consisting in laying down suppressive fire. This is reflected in the fact that any soldier can appropriately say, without equivocation, we laid down suppressive fire and we carry the POW to safety. We can ascribe inclusive authorship even to those soldiers whose attempted contributions were ineffective. This is because each soldier's decision and subsequent attempt to act according to her role has the cooperative act of saving the POW as its object. And this relates the soldiers teleologically to that cooperative act. And that's just to say that she has made it her function to help bring about this act. And it's this functional relation which survives a failure to contribute effectively. And it's this functional relation which grounds the attribution, the attribution of inclusive authorship. And I'll say more about why this functional relation grounds inclusive authorship shortly. So we can attribute inclusive authorship for rescuing the POW not only to the soldiers in the squad, but to any other member of any other cooperative project which shares with the squad the participatory intention of furthering the cooperative act of winning the war. Thank you. This is because rescuing the POW is part of the broader cooperative project of winning the war. So this can all be put in a more general schematic form. When individuals cooperate by intentionally acting according to roles, and each role has one of the same object, you can call it O, each cooperator bears inclusive authorship for O. Each cooperator bears inclusive authorship in virtue of the fact that each has willingly taken on the function 
of assisting one another in furtherance of O. This means we can attribute inclusive authorship for rescuing the POW to all the combatants in the country's armed forces, since rescuing the POW is partly constitutive of the shared object of their respective functional roles. So it's partly constitutive of the shared objects of accomplishing the war's aims. And it, even though the vast, vast majority of the individuals who bear inclusive authorship for this cooperative act do not contribute at all to the rescue, any combatant in the military can appropriately say, we rescued the POW. So having outlined the basic structure of cooperative projects, I'll turn now to the complicity principle. So recall that according to the complicity principle, a participant in a cooperative project who does her part in furtherance of a cooperative act but whose participation fails to contribute can nonetheless bear complicitous liability. The basis of her liability lies partly in her decision to do her part in the cooperative project by enacting a role in that project. And as I noted, enacting a role in the project relates the participant functionally to the cooperative act. And because she willingly took on this function, we can ascribe to her inclusive authorship of the function's end which is the cooperative act that the participants in the, pro in the cooperative project commit together. And this ascription of inclusive authorship provides a basis for holding her accountable for the cooperative act. So the account of cooperative projects of outline provides a basis for the complicity principle. We have grounds for holding combatants complicity liable uh, for the military aims which they are tasked with promoting. But not all participants in a cooperative project will bear the same degree of complicitous liability. One factor determining how much complicitous liability a participant bears is the degree of inclusive authorship that can be properly attributed to the participant. And one factor determining the degree of inclusive authorship is the type of role that the participant has in the project. All roles have, some, have the function, broadly conceived, of contributing to the cooperative act. But some roles have the function of contributing far more than others. So all things being equal, the greater the degree to which one is supposed to contribute to a cooperative act, the more prominent one's role in the, in the collective act. And the more prominent one's role in the cooperative act, the greater the degree of inclusive authorship that the participant bears. And since the inclusive authorship is a basis of complicitous liability, the stronger the attribution of inclusive authorship, the greater the degree of complicitous liability that an individual will bear for the cooperative act. So returning to the previous example, ineffective soldiers in the squad rescuing the POW will bear greater inclusive authorship for the rescue of the POW than will, for example, sailors aboard a minesweeping vessel a thousand kilometers away, even if their contributions to the rescue of the POW are on a par with those of the ineffective uh, soldiers in the squad. The soldiers in the squad bear greater inclusive authorship since they have roles that feature more prominently with respect to the end of rescuing the POW. So this factor determining the degree to which a participant is complicitly liable helps dissolve a potential worry. The worry being that the account of complicitous liability that I've outlined might overgeneralize by illicitly implicating civilians. So more specifically, one might worry that on my analysis of cooperative projects, the armed forces is part of a larger cooperative project encompassing all the civilians engaged in war planning, war provisioning, and war making. And one might go further by pointing out that since the military is an element of the state, it's natural to think of the government as a cooperative project which includes the citizens as its members, if the citizens vote government officials into office or if they pay their taxes, etc. This seems to suggest that my account of complicitous liability overgeneralizes by, implicitly, uh, by implicating a significant proportion of civilians. But this worry is unfounded. The function of civilians, such as taxpayers, is to contribute in ways that only have a marginal impact, at best, on the war, at least individually. So even if a typical tax-paying civilian, for example, ultimately contributes no more to an unjust war than an ineffective combatant does, the ineffective combatant can still bear substantially greater complicitous, liabil complicitous liability than the civilian. A combatant's role, in a straightforward sense, is designed to contribute to a far greater degree than the typical civilian's. Uh, after all, a combatant's successful contribution to an unjust war is enough to ground individual liability to be opportunistically killed, but not so for a typical civilian's successful contribution to an, un to an unjust war. So what underwrites the fact that an ineffective combatant will be more liable is not simply the fact that she would have contributed substantially if she had been an effective combatant. Rather, the degree to which she is supposed to contribute serves as a metric determining the relative prominence of the role she bears, which in turn partly determines her degree of inclusive authorship, which in turn determines her degree of complicitous liability, which in turn determines whether she can be permissibly killed. Uh, 
Now, an upshot here is that the distinction between those with roles designed to contribute substantially and those with roles des designed to contribute marginally, an upshot is that this distinction won't perfectly track the distinction between civilians and combatants. Uh, it's at least possible for there to be a class of combatants whose roles are designed to contribute so little to the war that combatants of this sort would bear no more complicitous liability than the typical voting and tax-paying citizen. And uh, skip all that. And likewise, it's perfectly possible, indeed there is, there are classes of combatants who have roles which are designed to contribute at least as much as that of the typical uh, combatant, and they would indeed be liable to be opportunistically killed, on my view. So uh, my account does redraw the line between liable and non-liable targets of attack and unjust war, uh, but it's unlikely to implicate a significant portion of the civilian population, nor is it, unli nor is it likely to uh, render immune a significant portion of the uh, of combatants, in my view. Uh, now, there is one problem that I want to address if there's time, a potential problem, and that's the problem of conscription. So, as I noted at the outset, this account avoids contingent pacifism, but it does constrain the wars that can be permissibly fought to a degree that's greater than individualist and reductivists think. It constrains it, um, well, th this is because of conscription. Uh, Though the object of complicitous liability, the cooperative act, might be an event out of the control of the liable agent, the basis of complicitous liability, her participation in the cooperative project, must lie in an event that's under the control of the agent in order to be complicitously liable. The person participating in the bank robbery had to volunteer. The person participating in the military had to volunteer. A combatant conscripted in unjust war on pain of prolonged imprisonment or worse will not be complicitously liable to be killed. Uh, might still be uh, individually liable, but not complicitously liable. This is since her participatory intention to act in accordance with her role as a combatant is coerced. So she's not to blame for her inclusive authorship for the war. So ineffective conscripts of this sort are thus not liable to be killed, since they neither contribute substantially to the war, nor do they bear significant complicitous liability. Now, I should say that unjust effective conscripts who participate under duress would still be liable to be attacked since their liability is grounded not merely in their decision to participate, but in their minimal responsibility for the unjust threats they pose. So I follow Jeff McMahon on this point. So whether a coercive threat undermines complicitous liability depends on the severity of the threat and the wrongfulness of the participation in the cooperative project. And since participation and furtherance of an unjust war is typically morally egregious, a mild threat will not, will not defeat complicitous liability. A fine or short prison sentence is presumably not enough. However, given the harsh treatment to which some governments subject those who attempt to evade conscription, many unjust and effective conscripts will not be complicitously liable. Uh, so, uh, to admit that many unjust and effective conscripts are not liable to be attacked doesn't entail in contingent pacifism. This is because all actual wars include many ineffective combatants, but not all actual wars include many ineffective combatants whose participation is compelled under threats of prolonged imprisonment or death. Still, the participation of these sorts of combatants is all too common. Uh, as a result, the scope of wars that can be permissibly fought if a collectivized liability-based account of war is correct, is narrower than what McMahon thinks it is, but not as narrow as the contingent pacifist thinks. So a collectivized liability-based account of war carves out a sort of middle path between the status quo in just war theory and contingent pacifism. Thanks. Um, Daniel. Here, thanks very much. And just a word about uh, in Jeff's move, um, at some stage of it is in his 2004 ethics paper, he does play with the idea that you don't, one doesn't have to have responsibility to this specific attack, but completely for other attacks, past attacks um, would be sufficient. And then he even says, maybe even just being a bad person, something like that. <laughs> um, and, um, I don't think he developed this line, but it, it should have, because this, this does follow from his emphasis on capability. Um, actually, recently, um, Gerhard Overland um, took this to an extreme in, in two papers he published, that um, if, you're, if, you're, if you pose the, the stress capability and so on, then you are a legitimate target 
for any kind, you know, anywhere in the world. Yeah. If, if it happens to be the case that the only way to prevent that murder is somewhere in Africa, so... So, so there, are two, there are two responses I have here. One is to re basically repeat what I said before, is that I find that, I don't know what to think about this. I tend to think it's implausible. I tend to think that it makes culpability fungible. Yeah, I agree. In, in, in a way that yeah. I think. But I think that what we want is, uh, oh yeah, sorry. Second point is that I don't know if that response will do the work McMahon wants it to do, because it will only make ineffective culpable uh, combatants. Uh, liable right. to be attacked. So there, there'll still be ineffective combatants who mistakenly but plausibly or excusably think that the war is just when it's in fact unjust and yeah. they wouldn't be liable to be attacked, even if we take this yeah. view. Okay, so my, my second point was, 